And I will stop sharing the screen and you can take the floor. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me, everybody. Great to be here um, in sunny Southwest Florida, even mm -hmm. though I'm in, uh, outside Philadelphia, New Jersey. Um, but I feel the, the warm vibes from, from all of you down there. So it's, uh, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, so my name is Jake Steinerman. I am the head of community at Spatial. Uh, I've been with Spatial about two years, uh, but I've been working in the AR, VR, XR, Metaverse, you know, whatever you, whatever the term of the day is. Um, I've been working in that field for about 10 years now. I uh, actually started um, my career in XR working for a manufacturing company, a uh, material science manufacturing company, where I started the first uh, their first AR, VR team uh, back in 2016. Uh, and then worked for PTC, uh, the makers of uh, Vuforia, uh, the AR uh, SDK, uh, was there for a number of years working in AR, primarily in industrial and enterprise applications, and then joined the spatial team uh, about two years ago. Um, and you know, initially, I'll, we'll get into it, you know, what I started doing at Spatial when I first joined is extremely different from what we're, uh, we're doing now at Spatial. It's almost like two completely different companies. Um, so it's really exciting, the, the journey that we've been on, and I think it's kind of representative of like a lot of the industry in a lot of respects. Um, but yeah, really excited to, to kind of talk to you in, uh, about building interactive social immersive worlds on how we're approaching that at Spatial. Um, so it'll be kind of introductory. If you, I, I know a number of people know Spatial. We were having a chat before um, we started, so there's some familiarity with Spatial. So I'll do a little background, and then kind of get into, you know, really kind of demos and, and want it to be interactive. So if you have any questions, if you want me to show you something or take a step back and do something again, um, or any questions at all, please let me know. Um, I like to have some interaction with the people out there, so I know I'm not. Just talking to my computer. Um, so that's great. So, all right. So just first off, for those who don't know um, or aren't familiar with Spatial, what is Spatial today? Or maybe you've heard of Spatial, but it's been a couple of months or a couple of years since you've heard about Spatial or in, uh, interacted with Spatial. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the case. It's a very different platform than it was um, uh, in the last, you know, say in the last two years. Um, so what Spatial is today um, is really a platform that allows you to create, share, and explore 3D experiences across web, mobile, and VR. Um, so we're really, our whole approach has been very creator, artist, developer focused in allowing you to build the 3D worlds and experiences that you want to do and allow anyone to come into those spaces, have a shared experience uh, through your avatar. Uh, we have Ready Player Me integration. Um, so you can have, you know, a custom avatar that works across all these different kinds of experiences. Um, so really trying to be, you know, an open, connected, immersive, uh, uh, you know, Web3, if you will, metaverse type platform. So over, you know, over the last, um, this day, this, the numbers here are actually a little out of date. Um, we haven't updated them, I think, since late last year. So they're about a month or two out of date. But um, over the last, you know, 12 to 18, about 12 months or so, you know, we've had over a million and a half uh, users in the platform um, and people are spending, actually, that there's a, there's a misprint there. Our, people are spending more than, I think it's up to 11 million minutes in spatial per week, it says per minute, um, 11 million minutes in spatial per week, uh, about, I think it was um, in the summer of 2021, so a year and a half ago now, at that point, Spatial had been around for about three years. Uh, we had seen uh, 10 million minutes in Spatial total over uh, uh, two uh, over three years. 10 million minutes total. Now we're seeing that every single week on the platform, people coming and interacting and building on the platform. And then on social media, um, you know, our our presence there has been growing rapidly with over half a billion impressions across our social and media um, channels there as well. So what is it that that makes people so interested in spatial? It, it's, you know, it's kind of the secret sauce is, is a few different things. Um, you know, one is that we are kind of number one thing that we aim to be is extremely accessible. And this is kind of seen across these kind of three pillars here. So one is like I mentioned before, being accessible across web, mobile and VR. 
one of the things that we learned being, you know, in the um, ARVR industry for a long time now is that especially over COVID, it's very hard to get people into headsets. While headsets are becoming extremely popular uh, and more affordable year after year, it's still really hard to convince people that, you know, headsets are the future, which we definitely believe that, you know, headsets are the future. Um, so one of the things we discovered, you know, when we were initially an enterprise company, and I'll show you that in a second, um, was in order to convince people that these immersive platforms were valuable, you had to meet them where they were. And that meant mobile devices, right? iOS, Android, things that everyone has in their pocket. And then of course, uh, uh, web and browsers. Um, everyone's got a web browser. You've got a computer or access to a computer. Everyone's got access to a web browser. So what we found was if we can make spatial accessible in a web browser on mobile, that gets people in much more quickly and then potentially converts you into a VR user um, you know, down the road. They see this really cool experience and then they hear from others, hey, you want to have an even better experience? You want it to be even more immersive? Go get a headset. Go down to Best Buy. Go, you know, go get a, an Oculus Quest. Um, and the experience you're having now will work there too, but you have you know that first person immersive perspective of that experience. So there's actually been a lot of conversion. I don't have exact numbers, but I just kind of um, off the cuff note, have heard many people buying headsets after they've experienced spatial in a web browser and, uh, and mobile. So while it is the year 2023, and there is, I know we all have our hopes and dreams of an Apple headset and the Meta Quest and Quest Pro are great headsets. And we heard earlier about all the new headsets that are coming out. Don't sleep on on web and mobile as being a, a bridge to get people into headsets in the future. The other aspect that we um, really focus on is being really visually stunning and having you know really beautiful environments and allow people to build really beautiful environments really, really easily. I doubt this is Maddox hasn't got oh thank you. Oh, thank you. Um so you know, but there's a lot of other 3D platforms out there today, uh, and there's been over the years. Uh, that may have had some of these characteristics, but a lot of them might look like they're from, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. They might be dated in their visual quality. You know, while beautiful environments and visual quality isn't the most important thing, it is still, I think, really important in getting people to come in and spend more time um, in, in these experiences. So having experiences that look really good and perform well across all these different platforms is something that's that's really uh, important to us. And then the last piece, it's kind of more relevant to kind of the Web3 industry in particular, like platforms like Sandbox and Decentraland and things like that. Um, there's no there's no cost at all to use the platform, no land fees. You know, a lot of these other platforms, you have to buy a virtual plot of land um, just to get started or to experience the application, experience the platform. You know, from our end, we don't want to limit people um, based on your economic status or, or whatever reason it might be to get come in and, and have a shared experience and meet people and have those those social interactions or even start building. Um, there's no reason why we need to replicate some of the real world issues we have in terms of like real estate and replicate those in the virtual land. So no land, nothing, nothing to buy, um, you know, no subscription um, for uh, for majority of users on the platform. So making it really easy to get in. Uh, really easy to build and then really easy to access um, these uh, the platform is, is what, what has made Spatial so popular. So kind of how things started. So Spatial started in 2017, 2018. This is what Spatial looked like, I guess, five years ago now. Um, this was at Mobile World Congress with the launch of the HoloLens 2. Uh, Spatial was one of a couple of uh, companies that was chosen to uh, demo the HoloLens 2 with their platform. So Spatial was originally this uh, almost holographic meeting platform, almost like Zoom in 3D, where you have a 3D avatar of yourself that gets created, and then you can have you see your colleagues next to you as their 3D avatars, and you can lay out content in the space. So we had companies like Mattel um, that you're seeing here would use Spatial to build their toys. Um, bringing their engineers and designers and toys uh, to design their toys uh, in spatial. And that's what we were really focused on for a number of years until artists and uh, and creators um, started to discover the platform in primarily in mobile and um, and web and started to build art galleries on spatial, immersive art galleries. And then 3D artists start to bring their 3D worlds into these platform into the platform. 
And really what that led to, like long story short, was the majority of the usage on spatial was being driven by these artists and these creators, not the enterprise. And it was mostly happening in web uh, and mobile, which is not a surprise considering most people have a web browser and a mobile device. Um, so fast forward to today and spatial looks like this. Um, this is a teaser we put out uh, last month of what spaces are looking like in spatial today, um, really being driven by our new uh, creator toolkit. So really beautiful entire worlds that you can create that are immersive, real-time lighting, um, and, and are interactive too, that reacts to what you do in the space. Even with some chat and emote functionality too, which is exciting. Some killer dance moves and all kinds of cool stuff that you can do. What are some of the things that y'all trying to accomplish this year? Like, yep. Yeah, so I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, get into that. I don't know if the audio was playing, so I don't know if I was just sitting there silent. But if you heard it, there was some music there too. It was very, very low, but yeah, no. I heard something. Oh, okay, okay. So oh, maybe, maybe it wasn't coming through the screen here. Um, so, so yeah, we'll. I'll get into to answer your question um, about what our plans are this year. Definitely, we'll get into that. Um, so in terms of you know how you can build you know getting into the, really the topic of today, how you can build um, you know these immersive worlds on spatial. There's a whole set of different ways that you can do that. You know, number one is taking existing content that you already have, say you built in Blender or 3ds Max or Maya, and dragging and dropping that right into spatial, right into the web browser, um, or importing through an integration like Google Drive. Uh, the other is through templates. So we have a whole set of templates, which I'll show you shortly, that allow you to just one click start with um, beautiful design spaces that we've created for you that you can get started with right away. We've also added Sketchfab integration. So Sketchfab being the internet's largest 3D model library or one of the internet's largest 3D model libraries, having that integrated directly into Spatial. So you can search their free content and bring that directly into your space, either an environment or objects to decorate your spaces with super quickly and super easily. Uh, and then the last bit, um, which we just uh, launched uh, last month, is our the Spatial Creator Toolkit, which is essentially our Unity SDK. Um, so you can now build, I know there's a, a number of people uh, on, the, on the call today um, who've already been building and publishing their spaces, which is really exciting. Um, but now you can build in Unity and take the power of Unity and publish one click, basically publish to Spatial. So you have your Unity scene um, and we support the, the universal render pipeline. So you get really high quality visuals, one click, and have that unit scene working on web, VR, and mobile with an avatar layer, with voice, video, and text chat, um, and everything else that comes uh, with spatial uh, combined with, with your uh, Unity environment. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really, really exciting. And really, that's going to be, in terms of getting back to the question of you know, what, what we're going to be focusing on you know, over the next year, is really kind of tripling down on that toolkit and, and adding more features and functionality to it to empower you to build more, say even editing your avatar or adding um, scriptable objects that you can add to the scene and other people can interact with, um, potentially you know drivable vehicles and things like that. Really all things that enable you to create more interactive experiences for visitors. Um, so whether that be mini games or things like that, um, that's, that's our real focus this year is how do we give you more things to do once you're in these spaces, not turning spatial into Fortnite, you know, or anything like to that level per se, in terms of like a shooter, but how do we enable you to build experiences that help stimulate, you know, social activities and conversation, just like if you go out and do a social activity with your friends, you're going to do an activity, um, but it's all for the sake of, you know, being social. Similar here, whereas before Spatial was focused originally on, you know, meetings and presentations and then evolved to being more art galleries or listening to talks. And it's kind of more passive. You go, you can meet people and network, but it was kind of more passive what you can do. Now leveling those things up so you can not just go and meet people and chat, but actually go and do things together, whether that's scavenger hunts or 
or like a, a game of soccer or things like that in these spaces and still across all the different uh, platforms uh, that we support. Um, so I'll, dumb, I'll jump into a demo here in a second and kind of build a little scene uh, to show you, show you what that's like. But before I get into that, I wanted to you know, make sure there's, if there's any questions, uh, happy to answer them. Finland Norda has a question. Sure. Yeah, I have a question. So I, I've been exploring platforms like this in the past. But often the problem is that the the creator tools are limited in that you can't really expand the the those creator tools to really uh, like build an entire application on top of them. And from a business perspective, that's a huge problem because a lot of you know when you have a team, there's so many things that you can do. But then you use a platform like this, and I've explored some other competitors to this, and. And it, they, they all have the same problem where, well, you can import models, you can do all of these things, but at the end of the day, you can't build your application on top of this platform. Um, even if it's, let's say, you know, Unity, there's so much that you can build within Unity, but you don't have the possibility of building all that uh, on Unity, um, on, sorry, on, on, on the platform using Unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are there certain things like when you say like building an application on top of the platform are there like certain things that you're looking to do specifically like that the other platforms aren't like allowing you to do yeah yeah for example um just scripting and unity is something as simple as that um a lot of the platforms don't allow it yeah and i think i think yeah. that was the problem with spatial the the creator toolkit as well it, didn't allow uh, game object scripts and things like that, but I'm not sure you clear me on that. Yeah, so yeah, so script, yeah, so like custom script and custom code is is definitely um, interesting, and every platform approaches it differently. Um, so you're right, like to be transparent, right now um, in our in our toolkit, we don't support custom code and, and custom C sharp scripts, primarily for a couple of reasons. One is you know safety and security. Someone could write you know a C sharp script. Right, that's running in the background of a scene in spatial that can do anything, and you may not be knowing it's happening. Whether that's recording your screen or or injecting some code into your browser or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So there's things that could be happening there. The other is um, really just kind of opening the door for other kinds of of misuse, whether that's intentional or not intentional. You know, if if someone writes some script that could be running a for loop that can then crash your browser, things like that. when you have like unlimited flexibility, that's good for a lot of people but it's also not good for a lot of people yeah and i think we're trying to take the approach of how can we be most accessible to most people we are exploring um and probably something we will do in the first half of this year is having like node-based scripting um like visual scripting so you can still have more flexibility but without opening the door for completely like anything uh custom because the other thing to consider too is the unique thing, it's not, I wouldn't say it's 1000% unique to spatial, but it's pretty unique to spatial, is that cross-platform compatibility and that you have to have these experiences running across web, VR, and mobile, which have different UX and UI considerations, right? How you build uh, a UI on mobile versus how you do it in VR are two vastly different things and a very kind of complex um, you know, UX question. So kind of taking a step approach is how do we build out that that developer flexibility while still kind of maintaining um i think a, a good overall user experience i kind of think of it almost this may not be the best comparison but i kind of think it almost is like sort of like myspace versus facebook it like in the early days at least like myspace you could do anything to your myspace page basically but, and you may have thought you had really good design chops, but like, if we all look back at our MySpace pages, they're probably were like trash <laughs> or garbage with all the, all the animations and things that were going on there versus kind of, kind of the Facebook approach was, uh, um, and this developed more over time was, it was more structured in terms of what you can do. You could customize your page. You could add different elements to it, but it was still within, you know, certain limitations. Um, and then over time, they added flexibility to write, you know, different apps and stuff that were laid on top of that as a platform, um, which I think was, you know, an interesting approach. I think similar kind of concept to, to where we're going, we still want to make sure it's still an overall good experience, but still with that kind of developer flexibility. Um, as 
Yeah, I understand that perfectly for the consumers, right? For your, for most of your users, you want that. It's just mm-hmm. that when it comes to like the business user, typically a lot of the problems that you're talking about, the business, the people, the business that is trying to use the platform already will work on those. That that's what they do. That's what their experts are. They just want to use kind of a this this your platform as a. Uh, jumping ground for their own app, but they already have all the security risk and all those things internally. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that comes up, people, you know, we get the question of like, can you sort of, you know, uh, white label spatial or, or or I've seen comments, you know, people looking to build something that's similar, you know, to spatial, you know, build their own thing, kind of roll their own. And I think, I mean, just like most SaaS products, right? Like most of the time, it's a smarter bet to go with a SaaS product versus rolling around. Obviously, there's some industries where you can't do that for security considerations or whatever it might be. I think it's becoming less and less of a thing these days, but it was for a while. Because um, yeah, the, the infrastructure costs, the security risks, all that kind of stuff when you're trying to roll your own uh, is much greater versus if you you know put that, um, you pay someone to build a platform that's trusted um, by others. Um, so I think that's, you know, that is an approach more and more people are going to take versus right now we're seeing in like the metaverse space, right? Like seeing so many different platforms being built and, and as it should be not saying that spatial is trying to be the metaverse or anyone's trying to be the metaverse. Um, but, um, I think there's, you're going to have to have a couple of different platforms that do things well versus everyone going and building their own metaverse platform. And then you end up just with like, at least when it comes to kind of Web3 metaverse and more gaming, you end up with like 10,000 different games versus things that aren't interoperable with one another, which is, I think, a pretty important part of what's ultimately being built here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Yeah. Uh, I, see, I see one question there. I'll answer that in the chat um, and then I'll kind of jump into like a demo. Um, so the question was from Brian, I believe, are you going to eventually incorporate AI generated 3D models into the spatial creator tools? I would love that. Um, we don't have, there's nothing, no project today that's being worked on for that, but I definitely see that happening um, in the future. I've, I've told a lot of people this, at least, you know, among, you know, people that I know is, I think one of the most exciting things that's going to happen in both like the AI and, and uh, these, you know, metaverse spaces is through um, like AI generated content. And I'm starting to see it today. Like I saw uh, my, fr- my friend, Dilmer Valencius, um, Dilmer V, the YouTuber, um, does a lot of great tutorials. He started to experiment with that as well, um, with ChatGPT integrated into Unity, where you can basically say, you know, put a cube, you know, in my scene that does X or that's animated like this. And it's essentially writing the C sharp scripts for him to do that. So like this stuff, I think by the end of the year, you're going to start to see a lot more of that. And you're starting to see that right with with NVIDIA and, and some of these other companies that are building the 3D generated um, or, or AI generated 3D models. I think taking that a step further where you can, you know, one day go into spatial or some other platform and be like, hey, AI, build me a world that's got a castle with a unicorn flying, doing, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever. And it'll just build that world for you and just having that instantaneous, like you can just whatever you can think of and speak, right? Today it's text. You know, I think you're very, very soon, much sooner than we think that's going to be 3D and 3D spaces. So I think that's uh, really, really exciting. And if if I wasn't super busy with the stuff that we're doing at Spatial, and I hope one day we get to that, that would be something that I would love to spend a lot of my time on is figuring out that, that problem, because um, I think that's super exciting. Uh, all right, any other okay. questions? Or yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so I know that you mentioned earlier that, can you hear me? Yeah, how spatial is, I like that it's uh, actually universal. You can use it on tablet, mobile, browser, or anything like that, or or the headset. The only reason I don't really use the headset is because I noticed, I don't don't know if it's the back, but spatial doesn't have a seated mode, like integrating spatial, because like I sit down a lot when I'm on my headset, Mm-hmm. And so when I'm in spatial and I'm uploading my builds into spatial, like they look so everything look bigger, like bigger than me, or it look like I'm at on the ground. Mm-hmm. But I realize it's just because I really it just spatial doesn't have a seated mode for like headset. So yeah. 
Yeah, that is something that we, I, I know we worked on addressing last year was basically kind of trying to detect in VR if you're, um, if, if the position that you're in um, was different from when you first started the app, say you went to go sit down or something like that. Uh, we try and detect that and basically say, hey, are you sitting or are you standing? Um, that's something that I know we've tried to, to work on in the past. Um, but you should, I know when, if you're in VR mm -hmm. and you go and sit down, um, so your headset is technically lower and other people maybe are, are also in VR or on other platforms and they see you, I believe, I haven't looked at this in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, um, you should still at least appear to them to still be standing or at the same position yeah. um, versus, yeah. you know, kind of like hunched over kind of awkwardly. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll was, save my other questions for later. <laughs> I was testing like real quick the, uh, when you teleport, you for some reason go to the left a lot. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, and then there is sound playing when, whenever you kind of jump, there's sound playing, which kind of gives you a little headache. So if, if that's possible to work on the controls to make it very smooth and not like as sharp and rapid. Like the, the smooth the smooth locomotion versus yeah, the They engines. removed the sound of it because I couldn't stay too long. And again, for some reason I was constantly moving. I don't know why. Okay. Yeah, that, that is good for you. We are working on a new like avatar controller, basically like movement, like mechanisms um, that should open the door for um, both enabling triggers to work in VR, but also different kinds of locomotion capabilities on, on VR as well. So I hear you. I hear you on that for sure. Um, cool. All right. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to change my screen share settings here. And apologies, because I have a very wide screen. So this might look kind of crazy. Um, but I'm going to jump into Unity here. Um, so, so I know, I don't know how much time um, we have, maybe like 10, 15 minutes. Is that right? No, go ahead as, as much as you need. I mean, yeah. I mean, we could be here till three in the morning. <laughs> but I, I, I don't mind. <laughs> I'll have to get to sleep at some point, but I do love talking about this stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I won't cover that. I know we talked about a couple different ways to build, you know, in spatial in terms of dragging and dropping, sketch rev integration, this and that. Um, so right now I'll focus on a, a relatively quick demo within our creator toolkit and what that looks like. Um, so working with the creator toolkit in spatial has, you know, some assumption that you have some, uh, has an assumption that you have some experience, you know, with Unity, at least a base experience with Unity. Um, but we try and make it as easy as possible to, to build things um, within the toolkit. So for starters, we do have actually a couple different example scenes that show you how to use the different components that we currently offer um, as part of the toolkit. Um, so for example, I'm actually gonna go over to our other scene here. We have this feature demo scene, and I'll load up. Uh, and this one is, is really cool because um, it basically takes all the different components that we currently offer and puts them into one scene um, as basically uh, an example um, that you can look at and leverage for, for each thing. Um, also some great assets like, tr like trees that are using shaders for leaves instead of individual models. So they're actually really performant. So you can actually build like a forest with them and it'll work uh, really, really well. But within Within um, you know this scene, we'll look at the different things that we have here. Uh, one is of course an entrance point, so where people start uh, their experience. We can have moving platforms, so supporting animation, so things like elevators or escalators or things like that to move people around the space. I've actually, I've actually seen people use this kind of creatively, um, whether it's like you know going on a hot air balloon ride that takes you around to different parts of the space, or a boat that you can stand on and it takes you to different parts of a of a space, um, is actually really really cool. So we have an example of of what that looks like. Um, intraspace teleporters. So if you want to move people to different areas within one space, uh, previously in spatial, um, and still today, we have portals. So you can drop a portal in spatial that allows you to go from one space, one spatial space to another, um, or you can even hyperlink portals to take you to outside um, platforms or websites. Um, but a lot of things we've heard people want to do is they want to just move within a space. Maybe you have a huge city that you've built or something like that. 
So having an interspace teleporter. So you could basically say, you know, when my avatar walks into this area here, this collider, you can see a little, um, that green outline, that's our collider there. When my avatar walks into that space, then send them to a target location, basically at XYZ coordinates. Um, so we can immediately send the avatar to a different location. So great if you want to give people a different perspective or take them into a different area, maybe a hidden room or something like that. Uh, that's a really cool component um, to be able to accomplish that. Uh, others, um, and probably you know, one of the, the most used components or what is going to be one of the most used components is uh, the trigger event. Um, so if I wanted to, when my avatar intersects with another object or maybe walks into a specific area, I can then trigger something to happen. So in this case, in this scene, we have a number of coins that are in the scene and we can trigger a sound and trigger uh, particles, kind of confetti coming out of the coins, basically indicating when you've collected um, those coins. So we can have trigger triggering components that you can assign to really any object or any area um, to do that. So whether that's a, an individual object or you walk into a specific area and you have particles appear when you walk into that area. Uh, the other is triggering, using triggers for animations. So as, and I'm currently in edit mode, so these triggers aren't playing right now, but um, as I approach, say, a door, I can have a, a trigger area you can see here. If I click on it, we have this, uh, uh, this cube trigger collide, this box collider. When my avatar enters this box collider, I can then trigger um, the door animation. So if I go over here to the, to the left side, click on the box collider, you can see I have this trigger event. This is provided by Spatial. Um, when I walk into that, then trigger the door animation. And then when I exit, so we can detect if you're walking into or out of that trigger. Uh, when I exit it, then play the door close uh, animation. So basically close the door behind me. And this is, you know, if you've used Spatial for a long time, these are huge upgrades because before what you had to do was build a, a 3D model in say like Blender that just had looped animations or were static. Uh, and you can walk around in an environment, um, even for the longest time, actually, we didn't even support um, different levels, like you couldn't go upstairs and things like that. So this is a, a huge upgrade. So now this is allowing for that interactive component, how the world and the environment can react, you know, back, uh, back to you. Uh, and then coming into the, once we're in this room, then we have, um, this is kind of getting back to our um, art gallery roots, you can add in empty art frames. So if you wanted to pre-position frames to put up you know, decorations, 2D images or videos, um, you can set these empty frame components, which would be locked in place where you specify. So it's really easy. If you wanted to upload NFTs once you're in spatial or other assets, um, this gives you those predefined positions uh, to do that, which is really great. Of course, being Unity, you can you know, position, um, you know, images or videos directly in Unity as well and upload that. But the frames give you that flexibility to change things directly in spatial, um, say in the web browser and the mobile app, which is much quicker to do. And then coming outside, we have our, uh, our projector surface component. So within spatial, you can screen share in the web browser. So you, just like we're doing now, um, in Zoom, you can screen share right into a spatial space. So a lot of people do this for like concerts or for presentations um, or, you know, do live performances. They'll share their screen, maybe like OBS or YouTube or something like that. And they can screen share directly into spatial. The surface, the projector surface component lets you have a defined area to do that. So as soon as you hit screen share, it'll pop up into that specific area at the size that you specify. So great for like, a, if you have a concert venue or something like that, uh, it's great to have that screen, that predefined screen space. And then that's that's really it. We do have some more trigger components here as well. And then another uh, avatar teleporter to take you back um, to the scene. So any question, I'm gonna jump into actually build on creating something really quick uh, in a different scene. So you see how this kind of works um, in action here. But any questions? I see there's some things in the chat here. Yes, yeah, uh, so um, back at the um, when you went to the uh, the frame, mm -hmm. I have um my frame. I put a frame in my world that I build, 
and then uh, I real I I, I specify specify the size, and I lo uh, put it lower, and then I just figured out I didn't like it. And I removed it, and it's still in my world though, right. even though I removed it from Unity, and it's literally not in my template at all. But mm -hmm. when I go to spatial, it's still there. Mm -hmm. So, and this is this is from this is yeah this is a unity published scene that you're talking about yeah yes, yes. so you and, well i didn't publish it but i've i did the test current space button and i mm -hmm. tested it and it's still showing up in the scene mm -hmm. even though i removed it from unity but it's mm -hmm. still showing up in spatial mm -hmm. so, okay yeah i don't know if it takes time to generate and make it go away or um, once you hit, um, it depends if you're publishing, if you're testing the sandbox, that's the, the next I, step, but we can, um, I can look into that for you. Afterwards. I think I know the problem. Um, what you have to do, make sure that your browser, the old one is closed, because if your old one is open, the new one, the sandbox will be showing the old one. You know what I mean? Like you have to yeah. close the previous browser and mm -hmm. then the new sandbox will refresh and you'll see the Oh, well, so you said, are you saying close the the whole browser? Like close, make sure the window, the, the old tab. previous testing sandbox window is closed uh -huh. because you know what happens when you test the sandbox, it will just open a new browser. Yes, window. it opens a new tab. Yeah, so make sure you close all the old ones. Yeah, and I, then closed the, I closed the current tab, that it, the old tab that it was, and I closed it all the way. So are you saying I should close the whole browser? No, not the browser, the tab. Well, I closed the tab. I did that and it didn't work. So yeah. So no, we can take it like it could be it could be a caching issue. So if you do like a hard refresh of your of your browser tab after you repackaged and retested your scene, okay. um okay. that that could happen too. It could just okay. Okay. Be a caching issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna jump into um, the, we, so we have two example scenes that we provide as part of the toolkit. Um, so the one we saw here and then the, um, this kind of island sort of scene here. There we go. Um, so both of these, this is a really great scene that's got some really nice lighting, like dynamic lighting as well. And that's what's, you know, a really powerful part of this toolkit is to be able to change the lighting really quickly. If you're a Blender artist, which I know, Engineer, uh, you you are, you work in Blender, being able to change lighting or bake lighting in Blender is super, super, super hard. And that was one of the biggest driving factors to you know having us put out this career toolkit with Unity is that you can have real-time lighting. So you can see here the shadows um, in the scene. If I wanted to you know change the direction of the sun, so maybe it doesn't look um, white like you know sunset as much i'm just going to back up here i can click on my directional light object here which is something that's just provided in unity uh, and i can kind of change the position almost like i'm changing the direction of the sun and you can see how the lighting change the lighting and the shadows if you look at the shadows on the ground those change as well um, simply by doing this and you can have that um that directional light or either even other types of lighting objects in the scene that are moving or that are changing, or maybe objects in the scene that are moving. And you'll see those shadows moving in real time uh, as well, um, which is really, really powerful and really adds to the immersiveness of the space. And now that's something that you're able to do um, super, super easily. So I know um, I've heard some creators who before they would take them literally days to bake lights into some of their Blender models. Now with Unity, you can have either baked or real-time lighting in a matter of minutes uh, and then publish directly to spatial. So the speed at which you can develop really beautiful spaces um, is really, really great. And if you're not familiar with all this stuff, that's why we provide these sample scenes with some of this really great lighting. Um, so you can get started and start to experiment um, with this lighting uh, here as well. There's this little um, bar over here on the right. It says temperature if you click on it. So you drag it and then you can set the, you know, the, in, in, I think if you click on it, you can even sample the sky. Um, so your whole environment has the same lighting. Mm -hmm. the yeah, I can do like the filter you say like. Yeah, like, you can do filter and sample it or move it around. 
I like yeah. that. That's really yeah. cool. Oh yeah, I actually didn't even know that you have these different kind of like I didn't that's I'm learning something. I didn't even notice that little button there. So global volume is doing that haze that you you know, you have this little haze, this beautiful kind of almost atmosphere. That, that's actually really cool. You can't do that with Blender. Blender is gonna be look very flat, like cartoon looking. Yeah. Yeah. Spaces like that, like we're some of the spaces we've put out in the past, we're kind of like republishing with our own toolkit and they look like almost like entirely different environments just because yeah just because of that lighting component um which is super powerful um does i'm seeing some of the questions in the chat over here that i have um on the side um are there any currently any available features to create interactions between two objects with triggers or do triggers only work after so um right now um the triggers are all based on your avatar position um, so you'll see if I bring up like one of these collectible items, we have like these kind of collectible objects. I go on the trigger object here. And these are currently um, just designed to um, work with uh, avatars. Um, but later this year, we will be um, adding updates to it that you can basically say when an object intersects with this, maybe it's like a soccer ball entering a net you know, then you can have like, you know, things happen. Um, so that'll be something that we'll be supporting um, soon as well. That's a good question. I think Frederick wants to ask a question. Sure. All right, I wanted to pop in. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm real big. Um, I liked it that last scene. Uh, we actually, um, me and my company, we ran through there and messed with the interactions. I was excited to see that. Because um, I'm really interested in bringing like art and educational like workshops. I even have like a small video game design. Do do you um, what do you say for someone that's going to be doing like a lot of teaching? Um, and then again, I do like that mobile how you can cross platforms. That's really one of the big components why I'm here. What you mentioned mm -hmm. about the headset, wearing headsets all day, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the like softwares or things that you think I should, you know, look out for getting into like art and educational video game design um, and using them different interactions like that? In terms, of, in terms of how how to build like different video games or tools to use to build those different games? Pretty good with like Blender and we're doing a Unity thing, but I'm just interested in maybe, you know, some different softwares that you see that would be... Um, compatible or it would be helpful, you know, with this platform. I mean, Unity, I mean, those two are great ones. I mean, to get started, I think you're already off on a really good start um, with those two. I can't, I'm trying to think of other ones um, to get started with, but those are two, you know, really, really powerful. And that's honestly what I see most creators doing today is they might start, they'll start with Blender, right, to build, you know, an environment or a space or a model because of the powerful tools in there. And then bring that into to Unity to add that lighting, to add those interactive bits and add physics as well. That's not even something we um, even touched on was the ability to add physics into these spaces too. Um, so, I mean, those two, I think you're off to a good start. I mean, honestly, I can't think of others outside of Blender and Unity that I would recommend um, for building these types of experiences. Gotcha. Yeah, I would, I would say Blender, Unity, and um, Udemy has a ton of courses, and I shared uh, the World Builder group, if you've seen that. There are three three new courses that I personally bought, two of them, um, and then you need to learn. If you go there, they have a ton. Um, LinkedIn Learning, again, it's a great source, but Udemy, they always have a great sale, you know, $11, $13 for an amazing course of like 10, 15 hours to get you up to speed with Unity. But this all you need, you know, Unity and Blender, that, that's two kind of most important tools. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So I figured I asked, you know, it's a lot of us yeah. in the room we may know something <laughs> that somebody don't know, you know. Well, that's a good, that's a good question. And then in terms of, um, I uh, mean, there's also uh, Mixamo, which is good for if you wanted to add animations to like non-playable character avatars. Uh, Mixamo is a great tool for doing that. We'll be at, in Spatial, we'll be adding, uh, we added a library of dances like right in platform and we'll be adding like uh, a, a bigger library over the course of the year. Um, but if you wanted to yeah, put avatars in the space that are getting non-playable characters and give them different animations, Mixamo is, is, is it, it's an Adobe tool and it's totally free. I love Mixamo. 
<laughs> yeah, Mixer Most great. Because uh, uh, what, what my plans are this year um, is to um, basically pull my whole portfolio in 3D. Mm -hmm. to 3D. Um, so, yeah, I, I, so I'm asking, so I'm looking for things to kind of help me, um, you know, make that as, as smooth as possible. It's never smooth. <laughs> Well, it can be. So like, so for example, so for example, like people doing like do, kind of doing what you're doing, like, so with spatial, you know, you don't have to go through Unity. Unity is this other thing we recently introduced just to give you the power of the platform to, you know, better lighting and things like that. You can, if you wanted to build your portfolio, you can take your Blender model or really anything. Here, I'll show you like really quickly how, how to do something with it. This is in spatial.io in my browser. I'll just so what three. I used to do in um, Blender is I used to build the world in Blender, save yeah. it as a GLB, and like you said, I used to just drag it into spatial. Exactly. Like yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. You can yeah take that right into space, or if you're like even taking a step back, say you're teaching students like, hey, you want to build a 3D space? It doesn't even have to start with Blender. Just to get them started, come to Spatial. We have all these templates here, including like all these different iterations of templates like Agora, which is a beautiful space. We just launched all these different templates. I can take, say, um, this version of Agora and just click click on it. And now it's um, with that template. And then within uh, within Agora, within the template, this will take a second here, um, I can then bring in my own 3D models. Um, I can bring in here. And you can see this is built this template was built with, with Unity, so you can see that, that real-time lighting and shadows in there, that high visual quality. I can either uh, drag and drop, if I come over here. Um, actually, I don't know. I can, yeah, let me, I, I think I have things preloaded. I can click add content. So these are things that I've already um, you know loaded into spatial. So I can take um, like this car 3D model that I have here. And this I just dragged and dropped into spatial and now I can drag it up. I can click and drag to position it. And I can start to decorate my space just through dragging and dropping. If I don't have any 3D content, I go into add content. We have furniture. So if you wanted to add in like all different kinds of chairs and seating to your space, I can take this really cool seat and lay it and put it around the space wherever I wanted to, put a chair over here. And now, you know, I can, I can sit on that or I have other people sit on that. And then the last piece is the Sketchfab integration. So again, Internet's largest 3D library is now accessible right to me right here. So if I wanted to search for, say, uh, dinosaur, if I can spell it correctly. Can, <laughs> um, can I make a suggestion? Because I haven't looked. I saw that you guys added Sketchfab. I think mm -hmm. it's very important, very, very important for you to add an option to um, filter by the size of the model and by polygon count, because some of those models are unusable. They're gonna crash your app, even one. Sometimes I would find something and it adds like half a million polygons into my platform. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Good, because I was asking, because what I'm thinking is I have some clients that, you know, I'm, 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 I wanna wrap my hands. We create everything from scratch. Like literally, and she asked a good question about the polygon count. So I want to make the world and then bring the <laughs> attributes and the different items in there. So about the polygon thing, how how, how does that work? You know, when you um, bring in items in here like that. I know. I know in Blender, you can control the polygon count. So in Blender, when you, uh, like she mentioned, when you take a take an item off a of sketch file, for instance, and you bring it into Blender, Blender is going to show you what the polygon count is of that item. They, they usually, if you go to the SketchFab, actual SketchUp uh, warehouse, they will tell you how much is it. So I usually filter it. So I filter like less than 10 megabytes. But I there is an extension that you can download from a third party. It's like an add-on to use SketchUp in Blender. I used to do Collada oh, file. Yeah, I got that. I got that. There is like Collada file and then I now recently do directly. So it's like a buffer. That, that yeah. are, it's a of, um it lets you control the polygon count in Blender. Like you can 
listen like mess with the mesh and you can like actually um decom what's the word i'm looking for like lower the polygon count basically yeah. yeah just yeah clean up decimation yeah yeah so no it's a great it's a great suggestion i know we are filtering automatically on um files less than 100 megabytes 100 megabytes is is our max 3d file limit but no 100 percent. you can have a 10 megabyte file that has you know, tons of poly tons of polygons most of the the, the megabyte count is usually around textures anyway um so yeah definitely it's good feedback on filtering because i've seen that myself too yeah i'll load in a sketch model and then yeah it'll it'll crash the space mm. um so that's a good suggestion for sure but just kind of getting back you know to before just in terms of creating spaces right it can start as simply as this right just importing models and using templates and then leveling up saying hey i want my environment to be something really custom then i can come back to unity and start to build some really unique things like i can you know start to build out different trees in the space and and all kinds of things like that um i just copied the leaves not the whole tree um but you can start to get really custom um the last thing i'll show because i do actually have to go in about like 10 minutes or so um is so how do we actually add some interactivity here in the space um so i have this uh piano that i've already built and i've had most of it set up here uh, and this is actually like an interactive piano that you can go and play with your avatar so this is a prefab so i've already built it i just dragged and dropped it into the scene um and then all these circles you can see here those are um audio basically the sound from the keyboard and the range that that audio is gonna um come out from in the scene um I'm just going to position my keyboard over here so we can get to it. I'm going to position it like that. Um, and then we have all the keys set up except for one for the sake of uh, demo purposes. I'm just going to uh, unpack this so we can edit it here. And if you see on each key, there's the Thunderbolt um, icon and there's a sound icon. Um, so if I, so the Thunderbolt icon is that spatial trigger component, basically. Um, that trigger um, object. Um, so if I go over to the A7 key here, I'll zoom in on that, double click it, you'll see a couple of things there. Um, so we have on each key, it's kind of hard to see. I'm trying to zoom in so you can see it. Um, you have, we have our trigger, our collider, our box collider, and that's where the trigger, the spatial trigger component is assigned to. So when my avatar walks into that trigger, then again, we're going to set off a couple of different events. We're going to play an audio source. So I have sound files for every single piano key. Um, and we're also going to change the color of a specified object. In this case, the mesh of the key itself. And then when the avatar walks off the key, we want to change the key back to uh, the original color. So it looks like we're not pressing it anymore. And we want to stop playing uh, the audio. Uh, we don't want to pause it. We want to completely stop it, just like you take your finger off of the key. Um, so how do we do that? So if I take, I'm going to, I have this trigger set up on the A7 key, and I'm just going to set it up on the B7 key. So I'm going to duplicate that trigger over here and add it to the B7 key. So it's associated with that. But I also want to make sure the trigger collider area is on top of the right key. So I'm just going to drag it over to the side here. So that way, when I walk on top of that key, we're triggering that key. And in this case, I want to make sure I'm triggering the right audio source. So I have under my trigger event, I want, again, I want to trigger the right sound. So I have, I have this set up in advance, but I have a sound file set up here. So I just want to say the B7 key which has an audio source. Again, this is, I'm taking a, a couple of steps ahead here, but I have this audio file attached to it. I want to, with that audio source, I want to play it on trigger. And then I want to change the color of this key. So I'm going to select that mesh of that key, B7 from the hierarchy, drag it here. And then we're changing the, the render of that mesh of that object. So I'm going to go to the mesh render material 
and we're going to change it to to glow indigo it's this uh, material that I created before and then when we exit so this is on exit uh, again I want to stop the sound so I'm going to take that audio object that I have the b7 key go to audio source of the sound and I want to stop stop that sound and then I want to take the the key itself and I want to change it back to the color that it was so I'm going to go to mesh render and material and in this case it's already pre-selected it because I had set it up previously is that solid glass color as it's called or that white color that it is so now we have a functional key that reacts to our avatar uh, and I've positioned it here in the scene um, as well so now that I've done that I'm going to just command s to save uh, the scene and then when you're working with the toolkit there's two things that you can do you can test the space um, so that if you just want to make sure the triggers that you set up and the other um, aspects of your scene are ready to go um, you just want to test it really quickly so we have test your space that's in your that happens in your private sandbox in your web browser um, so I'm going to click that to test that scene and that's going to package up the scene bundle it up uh, make sure it's all ready to go and then uh, it'll automatically open spatial in the web browser and then once we've finished testing and editing um, our scene and we feel like it's ready for prime time then we can hit publish space you do have to be an approved uh, publisher uh, to actually publish your space. Um, and when you do hit publish space, it'll open up a form um, that you can fill out quickly and we'll get that approved uh, as quickly as we can. Um, but publishing your space then on the back end, what that's really doing is um, from a technical side, it's taking your Unity scene and bundling it into versions that work in web, VR, and mobile. And from a technical side, that's fairly you know complex to do, but we're doing that all for you in the back end. So when you load spatial on your phone, when you load spatial on a VR headset or in your browser, that scene will work across all those different platforms automatically within spatial. Um, so we're taking what would be a very complicated process for a developer and simplifying it into just a click um, for you. So you don't have to worry about app stores or you know publishing or dealing with all these kinds of crazy stuff. You can just um, hit publish and it works on those all different platforms. So cool. So my scene um, in just a few seconds got uploaded into spatial. I'm actually in here twice. That's why you see me there twice. I'm gonna kill my clone over there. Actually, uh, there, there we go. And I just, what did I just do? There we go. All right. So I killed my clone and now we're here uh, in my scene. Um, I'm going to, here, let me share my sound because um, I'm going to reshare my screen here so you can hear the sound. Okay, cool. So I'm in my scene here. I'm walking around. This is exactly what I just published. And we have my piano. And then you'll see as I walk on the piano, it's not playing. As you can see, as I'm walking, changes the color and plays that sound and then when I leave the key it stops the previous one and turns it off and then the next one I walk on it plays and then that one, it stops and playing the keyboard itself and then we get to the last one that's the one that we um had set up and that's how children can play this book obviously you can get much more you know complicated in what those do we do have this other example that's pre-built for you here at the top, these collectible cubes. So these objects themselves uh, are trigger components. So as I walk into them here, they set off like a little particle animation um, in them as well. And that's those are pre-built and, and ready for you. Um, if we refresh, if I refresh the, the browser window here, those will those will come back. Um, again, but right now they're triggered just to play the animation and to disappear. Um, these other objects you're seeing in the background that weren't in my Unity scene, this is because it's it's loaded in my sandbox, and I've used my sandbox for other things before. Objects that I've loaded in, say through Sketchfab or directly in Spatial itself, um, in my sandbox, those will stay. We're just basically changing out the environment that was built in Unity, but these other objects might persist. I can delete them, you know, if I wanted to. I can click on it and delete it. 
um, but that's why you're seeing those other objects there. Uh, yeah, and that's the that's the spatial creator toolkit. Um, awesome. Yeah. Hope you guys found that interesting and helpful. I see Zach, you've got a your hand up. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Sorry, I'm actually logged in under a one of my team members, I think, because my name's Mark, but that's funny. Oh, uh, <laughs> I just realized I'm Zach tonight. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I just had one quick question. We uh, I, all this functionality is great, and I'm so glad you guys added this. This is more than we could so much more than we could do even a month ago. It's awesome all the progress you guys have made, and it's really cool to see where everything is headed. Um, but I was just curious, is, is there currently a functionality of just being able to say, pick up an object and look at it <laughs> up close for like, you know, if we want to show off a product that somebody can pick up and look at, you know, is there a way to do that right now? Yeah, in, in VR, if the object is not locked, um, someone can go up to an object and pick it up with their hands. Um, on mobile and in web, we don't have that capability, though that is something that we'll be adding soon. So basically, like, um, you, you'll be able to walk up to an object and you'll see a prompt for like either like the letter E key or like the enter key to interact with that object. And then you can have right. that interaction do something, whether that's like, you know, have your avatar hit, you know, a jukebox or, or yeah, pick up an object. Um, and so that works for people that aren't hosts, right? So anyone can just come in and do that, 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 will, that will be, yeah that will be the idea when we implement that right i mean even in vr right now you can do that like as an attendee right now, if the object's unlocked then yeah you can pick okay up. perfect that's what i was curious about i was struggling with that a little bit but that was because i was messing around in 2d so that's possibly what the problem was <laughs> <laughs> so thank you yeah. in, in 2d that'll be coming that'll be coming soon um uh, in, the, in the next couple months okay thank you yeah sure thing Okay, I wanted to catch you before you leave. Um, is it okay if I show you on um, my screen real quick? Sure. Okay. Okay. Oh, did we want to before we get into that? Did we? I don't. I want to make sure we answer. I said, Lisa. Yeah, had I think we need to. Um, if 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 we can answer real quickly all the questions. Um, yeah. Let Let's finish all the questions first, and then. And we can get into uh, because yeah. yeah, we don't have that much time left. We don't want to hold up the. I see that Lisa has a question. Yeah, it's very cool. I love it. I just love, simply love everything you showed us. And uh, uh, I'd like to know that, uh, so the web browser would work anywhere in the world, right? Internationally? I think the only exception might be China, but other than that, um, it should work anywhere in the world, yeah. Okay, so do you need to create an account and uh, uh, have your pick your own avatar, de design everything like that. Yeah, yeah. Creating an account on Spatial is super, super easy. Um, so I'll log out here just so you can see what that's like. But you can use um, Google, you can use Apple, you can use MetaMask if you have a, a, an NFT wallet as login, Microsoft or your email to create an account. So super, super easy. So I can click, you know, sign in with Google in this case. And like, you can create a spatial account, you know, in a matter of minutes. And then the avatar editor, we have uh, Ready Player Me uh, integrated. So mm -hmm. you can um, just edit your avatar through Ready Player Me. And we're gonna be introducing other avatar options in the future, uh, but Ready Player Me is great because they're cross-platform. Um, they have a lot of different options available and they make it super easy to edit and customize your avatar. All right. Um... It, do you have the capability of recording in your uh, virtual environment? Yeah, definitely. So if I come back here, in the top right, we have this little camera button. So we can, you know, quickly, I can take a photo, we can record a video, it'll record it to the WebM format currently. Um, and then we also have filming mode, which I love to do. Um, and that'll put you in this kind of camera mode and I can fly around, even change the speed of the camera and stuff like that and hit record and I can record directly in spatial. Um, and again, this outputs to a WebM format. You can convert that to MP4. Um, we also sometimes use Loom in your web browser, which is a, a, a web browser extension that'll just record everything, including sound in your web browser as well. Uh, that's a great tool to use uh, too. But yeah, you can easily record stuff. Um, so you can download the recordings right, to your local Mm -hmm. Yep, so that happens automatically. So if I hit record here in this case, 
and I'm recording a scene, doing, doing my recording and hit stop, you saw it just downloaded that file locally. It's not saved to our servers, that's downloaded directly to you instantly. Okay. All right, that makes sense. Then I can, yeah, I just open that in my web browser, it's a WebM file and you can play that back. Ooh. Thank you so much. We, we have two questions from David and Kelly. Yeah. Thank you, hey, Jake. This was this was awesome. I just had a quick question um, regarding full body avatars. Mm -hmm. Are spatial avatars always full body? I know some platforms when you start to increase the the load on the system, the legs disappear and things like that. Is spatial like that? We are proudly full body legs and all. We used to be half body. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are no longer torso only. We are pro legs at spatial. Excellent, uh, excellent, great. That was that was my. Whether question. you're in VR or whatever device you're on, you'll be full body. In awesome. VR, in VR, when you you won't see your own legs in VR, you'll just see your hands, but everyone else will see a full body avatar for yourself. You can great. and a little hint in VR, even in um, I wonder if I could do it here um as well we have a if you go under into your content menu and stuff we have a mirror object so you can add a mirror to the yeah. scene so if you want it to look at yourself in you can add this in vr too um you can have this mirror to look at yourself with if you really want to you know take a look at yeah. yourself I actually add a couple of those in in all the all the spaces I've created. So we have meetings; people can look around and see what they look like. So no, this this is great. I definitely use that feature. But thank you for that answer. That's great. Yeah, no problem. I just want to thank you so much. This was amazing. I haven't been on Spatial before, and so just to reiterate that, if I wanted to have a meeting with two of my colleagues, we create accounts and we can meet together like yep. yeah yes. okay yeah super super easy so you can yeah create an account with google actually the other person doesn't even need an account so for as an example if i let me go to like the space that i created um or i'll just create a new space like super super fast and let's just use i don't know this outdoor environment yeah. okay um, that's going to spin out this is a cool space because it's like beautiful stars campfire um things yeah. like that why That's wouldn't I want to have a meeting there? I'd rather have a meeting there than like in a freaking building with neon lights. Exactly. There's all these different options you can do. So that space is instantly like live. So I can take this link and I'm going to put it in the chat uh, in, where is the chat? I can't, oh, there it is. Um, and paste the link there. Now, anyone who's here, you can click that link and you can go in. If you're not signed in with Spatial or if you don't have an account, um, you can enter the space. It'll just ask you for your name and you can choose from a list of pre-built avatars oh, um, and then you can jump right in. So it's super, it's even easier to get into than Zoom. Zoom, you need the desktop app, right? Yeah, exactly. And you have to create a time and blah, blah, blah. Wow, that's freaking, oh my God. I just, my head is just blowing up. <laughs> that's so amazing. Thank you so much. I just, I'm just thrilled. Thank you for, um, just thank you so very much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was very, very cool. Yeah, thanks for coming. How often do you do these, uh, Jake? Oh, did I finish? I was just seeing how often y'all do these meetings where we get the, um, oh, I'm in here. <laughs> do I do like, are you saying like presentations or do we do meetings in spatial? Yeah, how often do y'all do these like different meetings like this or little updates and things like this, you know, demos and get to talk with you, Jake. This was real informative. Yeah, no, we, we like to do it as often as we can. Um, I was gracious, you know, to the to the team here invited me to talk to, to you guys today. Um, you know, I've talked at conferences and events around the world um, and like to do these, you know, you know, especially remotely as, you know, as accessible to more people, but I've, I've spoken at different events uh, around the world and happy to do these, you know, fairly often. So if you have different groups that you're a part of um, that want to learn about this stuff, um, you know, join, first of all, join our community. We have a Discord, um, which is 15,000 strong in our, in, in our Twitter community and everything like that, our Instagram, wherever you're at, um, you know, really strong communities there. And then, yeah, doing these kinds of talks and things, you know, we like to do these as often as possible. How can I friend you on here? Like, I'm in this space right now. So I click over your face and just friend here. Yep. So if you, yeah. So here, if you're looking at my screen, I can click on, I see IT Trey. Yeah. You just, you just followed me. I saw that little animation. I just click on your name at the top and then I can click follow. 
and then I can, then I'm following you. So anytime, um, so now I can see this is Lion Art King. I'm looking at your profile here. Um, anytime you quote unquote go live. So that's a feature that we have here. I can click go live. What that's going to do is anyone who follows me. Um, sorry. Good job. So anyone who, who follows me or has liked my space, you can love the space. Um, click the heart button in the top right to like, love the space. Um, anyone who's liked the space or follows me when I click go live and then click go live again, it's going to send a notification both on email. And if you have the mobile app and the mobile app, or if you've enabled it in your web browser, a web browser notification saying, Hey, Jake's going live in his space, come and join in. Um, so a lot of people can show up. Uh, it's a great way to kind of, um, do your own promotion of your space, um, you know, outside of social media. Um, it's great to notify people if you want people to come hang out or if you're hosting an event, um, say if we did this talk tonight uh, in spatial, you know, when we hit record instead we can go live and people will come into the space and, and join us. So that's, that's a really cool feature. Nice. <clears throat> I have a question about security. Can I block someone and remove someone from my face like it was yesterday? <laughs> Yeah. So if someone is some yeah. So if someone is bothering you or things like that, you can click on their name, and you have block report. In this case, I can remove um, as well. You should be able to see these features um, as well if someone is bothering you. That's cool. Rick, you can even it even shows that it's a guest user. Yeah. Wow. That's this is pretty. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, if someone's a guest. Yeah, you'll it'll pop up. Um, yeah, so Brian here, he's not logged into an account, so we can see he's a guest. I followed everybody else, so <laughs> I tried. <laughs> but no, this, this, is, this is, um, yeah, this is really nice. Yeah, it's really nice. Do you need to publish this space in order to um, invite others to join, or you, you, you just uh, send them the link without publishing? Yeah, so you don't have to publish. So it depends how how visible you want the space to be. If you just want it, if you want to essentially kind of keep it private, more or less, like you can just share the link. And it's it's kind of like a Google Doc. It's by default, it's set to anyone with the link can view. Um, so only those who have the link can find it. If you do want it to be open to the world and you want anyone to be able to search for it or discover it, yeah. you can either hit that go live button. And what that's going to do is um, other than sending the notification, it'll pop it on this live now tab on the homepage. So we can awesome. see all the different spaces that are currently live and there's a bunch of people in them. Um, so people can discover it. Um, or if you didn't want to do that kind of loud notification, you can just click this publicly listed toggle. And what that's going to do is it'll make the space searchable in spatial search. So people can just search for it and discover it that way. And I'm glad you um, mentioned live. that. Do you only go live once on the free plan? Uh, on every 24 hours. Yeah, so there's no, yeah, it doesn't differ depending on it. We have Spatial Plus, which is more for event hosts. Oh, um, okay. Additional okay. Features. Whether you're on the Spatial Plus or the free plan, it's just um, once per space. You can only go live once per 24 hours. Oh, okay. And then, the, you, can you customize those links at all that are brand the links that you send out? Well, he read that on my mind, like, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, remember that IP tray? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, um, so for going live once for 24 hours, part of that is to help prevent spam. So people can't be going live and sending you notifications like constantly. Um, so we're trying to balance that. Um, in terms of uh, customizing the link. So the link um, will actually change dynamically as I change the name of the space. So if I call this, you know, my campfire, space you see the link at the top changed to my campfire and you see it here as well it'll still have this tag this number at the end um we uh, may might kind of hide that in the future but um at least yeah. if you hear this on socials the first few characters you know that appear in a tweet it'll just look like spatial.io slash you know, yeah that campfire. was my core thing like if i have a custom domain that i own That's can easy. i use that and attach that to space instead of using the spatial dot whatever the name of our world is you could not with i mean um there's nothing within spatial the platform itself to do that but if you had your own uh you know web host 
you could do something like a masked URL redirect, which is basically within your, your hosting service. You can basically say, hey, my website.com slash spatial, that'll mask redirect to spatial basically. Mm. Uh, so not something that we do, but you can easily do that um, on your own web service. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, so the, the, the real quick question I do have about the avatars, it, one of the things that we hear a lot from our customers when we're in all these different platforms is, is just that sort of immersiveness of the avatars themselves. So a lot of, I love all the really awesome things you can do with customizing your avatars, but things like the eyes and the movement of the eyes, you know, you, there's, you get that sort of uncanny, uncanny feeling because the eyes don't like follow you. A lot of platforms kind of have that functionality. Is there any like thing on the radar that may be going towards that or something? Cause that's a really big thing that we hear from our customers a lot. Yeah, a lot of the dependence on some of the hardware, there's there's starting to be some advancements, at least if we look at like the web browser version, some advancements on being able to do like head tracking through a webcam. Um, that's something we've experimented with in the past. We haven't productized it. Um, and then part of it comes down to like hardware, right? Like the the quest MetaQuest Pro. Well, eye not so much not so much as it track your eyes in real life, but I mean in in VR, the eyes don't look at me. Like I'm not like you're looking at this avatar and the avatar is not looking at you. Mm -hmm. um, when you're in VR and you're looking at the avatar's eyes, it looks like you're actually looking down and not mm -hmm. right at their face. So things like that. So in other words, it's not so much what my eyes are doing as it is what the eyes of the avatar are doing. Like they just kind of stare straight. They don't look around or look at the person talking or anything like that. While some platforms I've noticed that works and there's a sort of really nice immersiveness that comes from that. So I was just curious if that's something that's on possibly on the radar or well, something that's even been mentioned before. I was just wondering. The, the spatial, it doesn't have eye tracking because you don't even need a camera. I mean, how do they know where you're looking if you're just looking at a browser? If you have no. a car headset, then it tracks your... So what it does is it, it's basically all the eye is doing is it's just a, uh, if you're if you're familiar with the, the actual programming side of the thing, but it's just all it's doing is saying, hey, there's sound coming from this, this avatar is speaking, so now my eyes are going to look at it. Like, it's just something that they do. They added to the feature of the platform that kind of added this nice little immersiveness. Because when you talk, you you know, you want someone to look at you while they're talking. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's just, it, it's in the program. It's not the person looking at you. It's the avatar looking at you, if that makes sense. It's looking at the person talking. Do you kind of understand what I'm saying, Jake? Yeah. No, I do. Yeah. They programmatically saying, hey, I'm standing next to this person. They're talking. Yeah. Look at my eyes are going to look at them and it's only happening to them like every avatar in the space is seeing them looking at them kind of to some degree you know but that's kind of how it worked and it really does add a really nice sort of immersiveness to the to the avatar and i was just curious if that was something that anybody had ever mentioned or brought up before they haven't really it's good it's good feedback i'm trying to wonder if we tried stuff like that in the past i don't think we have but it's good feedback i'll share that with our team is that, well, that thank I you i agree that would be that would add to the experience for sure yeah now there's definitely this kind of like flat faced kind of uh look to the with editor. amazing will, with amazing customization by the way but still it's... <laughs> they will they will gesture i'm going to turn my if you're in spatial itself i'm going to turn on my i'm going to unmute my mic in spatial um you'll see as i talk as i talk, as I talk, as I talk. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah so uh my avatar is now like gesturing as i'm talking so we are reacting to me talking and it kind of gestures as if um, I'm talking a little bit. So we do some of that. Which is a great feature in 2D. Yeah. I love yeah, that. You'll see the mouth, the mouth moving as well. So as I talk, uh, my mouth is, is moving. It's not, it's not exact with my words, but it's, it's giving that sense. Um, no. And that's one of the best I've seen, honestly, like the move, mouth movement is some of the best we've seen. I, lo I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, cool. I see Michael, you've got a question, probably last question. Um, and then. I got a balance. Oh so. yeah, you know, you answered it on the links. So uh, okay. thank you. let me take that down, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. You for that question too, Michael, you kind of brought it back around. It's good, <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. Well, um, I think we're gonna thank our speaker today. Yeah. So I didn't get to uh, oh. show on my problem, but I Yeah, I can't I share. I can't. I have to give you host tools, uh, unfortunately. Uh, trial. If you want to, if you want to follow with me afterwards, yeah. I can take a look sure. and, and see what's going on. Uh, we can find me on, on like our Twitter or Discord. I don't know where the best avenue okay. is. 
and we yeah, can. Yeah, and uh, you always answer. I also on Discord, and you know, Jake is always answering questions there. And I see, you know, that they have very, very active community. And also, I try to answer questions if I can catch uh, something. Okay. But I'm going to stop recording.